Yes, sir. Do you do the same thing in the morning? No. So, uh, that in the morning with the seniors, I'm doing a fertility class. I'm just joking. And so, um, <laughs> anyway, join me in, in Genesis 1 tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about some stuff that will set us up for some stuff that Caroline will bear the weight of next week. And so you get kind of stuck with me tonight, so I apologize for that. I know. Go back to sleep. Genesis 1. Look with me at verse 26. All right, so God, this is... Part of the week of creation, we're told, God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. They'll rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. <clears throat> there are really important takeaways from this verse that have a lot of bearing on some very hot button issues in our society and culture uh, that aren't just ideas at a distance, but very much are issues that, that families, even Gate City families, are experiencing and wrestling with and struggling with. Uh, these issues that this specific verse uh, speaks to are issues where we have and are operating in a culture that is telling us this is not how it operates. And so if it is that you're a follower of Christ and you're trying to pay attention and be mindful of what God has said, you'd better understand what it is that He has said, what our culture is saying, and are the two in agreement, and where, did, where is it that you and where is it that your family is going to land? All right, so in, in terms of that verse, if you look at what verse 27, there's a few basic takeaways, I think, some, some pretty clear things you'd say, all right, based on that, that tells me a few things. What does it tell me? Well, it tells me that um, that's exactly how you said it. Yes. Yes, but I, but I'm using that because that's I mean, that's you're hearing specifically this. In fact, if someone someone may identify as saying that they are non-binary, and so bi means two. And so this verse tells us that people are what? They're one or the other. It tells us that gender is binary. What else does it tell us? They were made in God's image. All right, so that we are, yeah, that we didn't, <laughs> we didn't come out of the ooze. Yeah, so that we are made, and, and, and I, in fact, I was getting ready, I'm glad you did that, but I was getting ready to break Frank's down, but you, you beat me to it, but the, um, that we didn't simply show up and that we are here. So we are made, we are made in God's image. Yes, ma'am. No, I, I think what you're seeing there is, and this is, this could be a long answer. I won't allow it to be a long answer, but I'll be glad to flesh this out more. Let me just give you the, the quick, the, the quick synopsis. Oh, for the Trinity. Okay. So okay. you you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, one God. Okay. Three distinct persons where there is subject-object distinction such that. And you see it with the baptism of Jesus. You have Jesus being baptized, the Father speaking, and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And so here when you have this conversation, God's not talking to Himself, but the Godhead, it seems, is speaking. So when they say, yeah. Yeah, so well, uh, well when I, I, excuse me, at least this specific conversation, let us, I, that, that's who, that's who the, the we be, I believe. This one, the, what, the next thing I'm going for is, 
It's a derivative of this thought that I am made or that people are made or that we are created. That suggests something. Uh, I don't know if I can bait you for it. Just, just ponder that thought for a moment. The, the fact that we are made, that we are created, suggests something. It's not a choice. You're born with whatever, you know. It's not an accident. Just say that again? It's planned. Planned. And so and the word I was thinking is this. That, that we are intentional. That, that as people, God planned to do this. The fact that there are people. Uh, so... The, not just me, but every person that has, that is, or will ever exist, they were intentionally made by God. And that we did not simply show up, but that we are made and created. Specifically, we are created in God's image, and with respect to how it is that we are made, that we, oh, that we have gender, and that gender is binary. All right, so... We'll think more about some of these here in just a minute, but I want to think more about this one here for just a moment. In light of this verse, I believe it communicates to us some stuff about gender. So this tells us, I think, this verse tells us about gender that it is binary, that it's male or female. What else do you, would you say it, it is suggesting by virtue of that? And in the scheme of that, everything I'm thinking about related to gender, based on this verse, extends in part from, the, from these things as well. So that gender is, is binary, it exists as male or female. What else? Hold that thought for a moment. Um, If it's binary, if you're male or female, you are male or you are female, that suggests something. That, well, it is one or the other, and it. Choice, it's not optional. Or, so um, it doesn't reflect a choice. I'm sorry, you said one other thing. Um, it's not a In other words, I can actually say one day that I'm this and it's not fluid. I'm sorry. Oh, I think in binary, mutually exclusive is just. Anyway, that's fluid. I lost a question. Fluid th 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 doesn't change. And so there are. I mean, it really is pretty staggering to think about. I mean, sincerely, 20 years ago, some of the conversations that you were hearing, I mean, just 20 years ago, or even to say in, in 2000, I mean, you think about what was going on in 2000, we're st still trying to think, did everything make it past the Y2K thing? I mean, who was thinking, no, there are multiple genders. In fact, now, the U.S. State Department, this past week, is the first time you can get a gender X. What the heck is that? All I'm saying is, if I have a country and you come in as X, door shut. I'm sorry, you can pick one or the other. I mean, it's craziness, but the fact that 20 years ago, just 20 years ago, one generation, this is where we are, such that I mean, among the whole litany of options that people give with respect to their identity, that they are either non, so you have male. You, in fact, some of you, if you haven't seen this word, psi gender, do you know what that means? Cis or cisgender, what, I don't know. What, what that means what? That you, that you are male or female. So if you see that, right, and so your anatomy and gender line up. As opposed to, well, non-binary, so that you are, you, def, you defy classification, that you, um, and, and in some cases they're saying or suggesting that it, it changes over time. And ultimately what we are operating with is a society and a culture that tells us this, that gender, is a social construct. All right? Our society tells us that it's a social construct. What does Genesis 127 say? That there, there is a, there, there's a theological reality 
It is, gender is not a social construct. It is a creative manifestation that, that we exist in the form that we are because, going back to this a while ago, that, w that we are made, that we are created. Um, the other extension I say that is, let's see, not sure, how did I say? It's kind of an extension of this. Uh, that I, I said it's it's not self-determined. So I, I, I do not decide, I did not decide that I am male based on this text. I, I am what I am because I was made. It wasn't self-determined, it was creator-determined. The one, the one who made me determined this. All right, so Genesis 127 is telling us this stuff related to my existence and related to my gender. All right, so let's think for a second. about what our culture is telling us. First of all, with, the, with, with how it is that you exist, the nature of your existence is what? How'd you show up? All right, so you are In fact, how, how does that, I mean, how, how are we taught this? I mean, so that, that somehow in the eons of time, there were elements whose existence cannot be explained. That in the presence of time and pressure created an explosion and matter somehow is formed out of this and begins to coalesce into some primordial goo. That this goo begins to develop over eons and eons and eons of time it almost reads like L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics. I mean, but it would be funny if it weren't funny. But the problem is, every one of us in this room is paying through your property tax dollars, you are paying an education system to tell your kids this is how it works. I hope you understand that. And that it's easy to laugh at this when you step back and say, really? Really? But we are subsidizing this. We are paying for this. At the same time, they are saying to your children that you are an intellectual Neanderthal for questioning this. This is how it is. That out of this primordial goo, somehow out of chaos, comes order. Now, is that a logical notion that order comes out of chaos? It is completely backwards. In fact, it is, to use our culture's phrase, it is non-scientific, right? Because the law of entropy, I forget what that is, either, either first or second law of thermodynamics says that things go from order to chaos. But again, we are paying and subsidizing to be told and have generations of children to be taught, no, this is how it works, that out of chaos, Random chaos, order comes. And what type of order? Colossal order. Mind-boggling order. I mean, if you, th I'm just re I mean, regularly, I think, isn't it amazing how many medical specialties there are? Like, I had to get a gum graft back uh, at the beginning of the year, which, let me just say, if you're thinking about signing up for stuff, don't get in that line. And so, but you go, you don't go to a dentist, you don't go to an orthodontist, you go to a periodontist. And so all they're kind of looking at is like gums and root canals. And that's all they're doing. And then there's, what, what, I don't even know what endodontics do, does. I mean, it, it, think of all the specialties there are related to your teeth. I mean, like your great grandparents, they just went to a carpenter, right? And so, um, but all, but that in part is, I, I think, reflective of just how complex we are. And so when we talk about us going and experiencing order, we're talking about mind-boggling order. All right, so again, our culture is telling us that our existence is accidental and it's random and that out of chaos, order comes. 
If that is in fact the case, what does that say about my essence or being? That, that my presence in the world lacks something. Any takers? I, 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 how can you argue, argue that I have purpose if, if I'm this? If I am an accident, if you are an accident, when you, because I think at the end of the day, everyone is going to, and I, I don't know exactly at what age, but certainly by the time you're getting into the, your 20s, and it, unless you're just drunk all the time, it, maybe later you start to uh, evaluate the question, you know, why exactly am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? I mean, am I, am I just here by chance? And I'm telling you, our culture is telling us, academia is telling us, yes, you are here by chance. And if you are here by chance, you, at least you, you don't have purpose, or at least at the very least, you have to say you have no given purpose. So if you have no given purpose, what does that say? I have, I operate with self-determination. That I can be whatever I want because I determine my purpose. Um, It is not simply that, uh, that our academic structures, by and large, are gathering around this notion that there is this big bang that occurs, but that big bang sets off an, an evolutionary process. And uh, to in Darwin's own mind, the, the, the way to explain this was, there's a particular catchphrase, it's survival of the fittest. And so the only reason that a species survives is because that particular animal or that particular species is uh, sufficient or superior to those that are around. Now again, that even on its face doesn't pass the sniff test because... That was Hitler's premise. Do I? That was Hitler's premise. The Nazi premise. I'm sure. They were developing a superior race. Superior race. Um, but the, the, the part of the problem is if, if you have superior life forms, that suggests something. If, that, if Darwin was correct, how can there be lower life forms, right? But we have, I mean, I, mean, I love our dog, but man, she is dumb. <laughs> She's really dumb. And if it is survival of the fittest, and if only the strong survive, how can sweet little dumb flower pot be around? I mean, th th Again, there, there's, a, uh, there's a failure, I think, at basic logic in terms of what we are told and communicated to. This is exactly how it is. All right, so we, we are told to operate with evolutionary biology, but you can't operate with evolutionary biology without it translating into evolutionary sociology. And so if, if we are operating with this survival of the fittest mentality, then I should do whatever advances me, right? I do what I want. What helps uh, me accomplish what I think my purpose is, what my goals are. If that offends you, who cares? Because I'm advancing my game. I'm trying to get further down the road. I'm trying to stockpile whatever it is that I'm trying to aim for. And so I think at the end of the day, not only is it arguing for self-determination, but it is flagrant selfishness and self-absorption. At the end of the day, this, this creates a world that revolves around what? Around me, what I want, what I think, what I like, what I prefer, what I want. You, to heck with you. We, I, we get here logically from that. My world is about me. Is there then any wonder when there is a pervasiveness of this mentality and then when there is a pervasiveness of this, this type of worldview, is there any wonder then that we are arriving now in 2021 that people are saying, you know, I am gender X, that I, I will now go by the plural pronoun they, which if, if, if people are going to do this, at least do it with proper grammar. And they is in the plural. That drives me crazy. And so um, it should not surprise us that we're operating in a culture that lands there because that's what this produces. Uh, a world filled with people 
where the mentality is swirling around them because they identify their purpose, they identify what they prefer, they identify what is right. And in the scheme of things, what we have just described and what it is that we are experiencing, this was predicted. The circumstances that we are experiencing was predicted. I've looked at this in some Bible studies before, but it warrants a, a brief perusal of this. Look with me real quick at Romans 1. And this is the question I want you to think about as you look at this. When God is not the starting point, what happens? All right, so start with verse 18. It says, The wrath of God is revealed uh, from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people, who by their, by their unrighteousness they suppress the truth. Talked about this before. The best definition of truth is that's how the state of or the reality of how things actually are. And so it is angering to God when people suppress an understanding of how things actually are. But then it starts to get really important, starting in verse 19. It says, Since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. Verse 20, His invisible attributes, that is, his, his, excuse me, his eternal power and His divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world. All right, so verse 20 tells us that, well, actually, 19 and 20 tells us that there is no one that, that is without excuse in terms of understanding two basic characteristics of God. And what are the two basic characteristics he communicates? His eternal power and his divine nature. All right, so divine nature. So ultimately, that, that God is and that he is, that he is other, that he has a divine nature. He doesn't have me nature. He doesn't have you nature. And Paul says that these things are evident through what? Through nature, in fact, through, or, and, and since when? Since when have been, people been able to tell this? Creation. Paul says since creation. So since the starting point, the fact that God is, and God is other than us, and not just other, but vastly superior to us, that this has been around, the awareness of that has been around since God made the world. Unless, of course, Paul says, that gets suppressed. You tamp that down. All right, but he continues by saying... As a result, people are without excuse. Verse 21, though, although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or show, show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless. Their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. All right, so when God is not the starting point, it goes without saying that I am not... I'm not going to recognize it. Doesn't that go without saying? So if, if I think that I just showed up and I'm going to remove him from the equation of my existence, that God is not and he doesn't exist, then I'm not going to honor, I'm not going to recognize him. And Paul says, if that's the case, something else I'm not going to do. I'm not going to be, what? Yeah, I'm not thankful. Why would I not be thankful? I got nobody to thank. And so, and then, honestly, at the end of the day, it's puzzling to me. Why, what does an atheist do on Thanksgiving? Really? I mean, who exactly do you thank? I mean, if all the stuff is just here, well, I'm just glad it is. I mean, I, I, I mean we call it gladness giving. I don't know. But if, if you don't believe that you have received, you have no one to thank. And so if you don't believe that God is and that He has made and that He has revealed, if He hasn't done all those things, then the natural response is, well, I got, there's no one to be thankful for. But then He continues. So, I'm not thankful. I have no one to thank. And then I begin to think of myself how? I get really smart. I think I am 
brilliant. Now, let me ask you this. On what basis might I say, or anyone say, I am really smart? Oh, I'm sorry? It's a comparison. All right, so if the only thing that you have your, to compare yourself to is other people, you can arrive here, can't you? If, because <laughs> they're a good Walmart. I mean, you might think I mean, the next Nobel Prize, they could be showing up at your door, right? And so if God is not part of the start, if he's not part of the starting point, I'm not going to recognize him. I have no one to thank. And I'm going to increasingly get elevated. I'm going to think I'm pretty stinking smart. I got this figured out. I got the questions of life. I can answer them. All right. And so I get really smart. Um, starting in verse 23, what we, I start doing. Yeah. I become an idol factory. And I start elevating the creation rather than the creator. And at the end of the day, how it is that we exist, we are looking for something to elevate. We just are. We're looking for something to put on the elevator. Uh, and sometimes that can be us. It can be another person. It can be, I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, Hinduism is flagrant idolatry, right? And how many Hindus are there in the world? Like more than a billion? That's a lot of them. Why is that the case? Well, in part because there's this desire within us to elevate something. And so in this case, when God's not part of the equation, you're going to find something to fill in that blank. And it can be something that's made with your hands, or it's going to be something uh, that, that maybe it's even yourself, that you elevate yourself. Uh, but at the end of the day, whatever gets elevated is something that is made, not the one who makes. All right, so once you get to that point... You see in verse 26, for this reason God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. So there, 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 is, an, there is an order of operations, and then this begins to progress into, and he says that, that you experience what? When he talks about disgraceful passions, what does that mean? Or um, I'd call it this way, out of... I begin to experience out-of-bounds desires. But I don't deem them out-of-bounds. Why? There are no bounds. Why? Because I just, I came out of the ooze. All right? Second part of verse 26. The women exchanged the natural sex relations for unnatural ones. The men in the same also left natural relations with women and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty for their error. All right, so um, what's he describing there? He's describing homosexuality, but I would make it more broad to say this. It is... Deviant sexuality. Now, deviant sounds particularly negative, but what's the root of deviant? Devil. Not devil. Deviate, right? If you deviate, what are you doing? You're getting off course. And so, what you see going on here because he's establishing a contrast. He's saying that women are doing this, men are doing this, and he's exchanging natural relations. So normal, they're, so they're deviating from that for unnatural, deviant forms of sexuality. Now, part of the reason we started back in Genesis 1 is because relative to these questions about human sexuality and gender, everything really does kind of start in Genesis. Because if you get Genesis 1 wrong, everything else is a house of cards. It just is. Because either you are made or you're not. And if you are made and you were made with intention and purpose, that means that there's a plan for how it is that you're to operate. That there are some bounds that you're supposed to operate. That there are some norms that are acceptable and then there are some behaviors that, that candidly are not. And when he is not part of the starting point, it's going to put you on a track. And candidly, we see this in our society and our culture. Uh, 
I was reading a, uh, or saw a statistic, excuse me, a statistic the other day, specifically Americans, but um, I'm sure it's true worldwide that the millennial generation currently is on track to be, without question, the most educated society in the history of mankind, the most educated. But it's also, with respect to the church, it is overwhelmingly, like off the charts, the least religious, the least religiously affiliated. Now, if you want to take what Paul says, that professing to be wise, they become fools. And so we're operating in a society and a culture that is deeming itself to be so erudite and so learned and so enlightened. I mean, you've heard me describe this before, but I, I remember, in fact, the, the, the hubris that it took to do this is still appalling to me. But with respect to the, to the gender issues, I really believe that Bruce Jenner was a seismic uh, shift changer in this whole debate. Because I remember watching, as if you'd go through the grocery store, you would see pictures of him as Bruce Jenner on the Inquirer or Star or whatever these things are. And he was kind of a, like a laughing stock because the question was, is he trying to become a woman? He's growing his hair out. Looks like he's got his Adam's apple shaved. Is he, is he trying to become a woman? And he looked like a joke until he goes from the Inquirer cover to the cover of Vogue. And then I think the cover said, I am Caitlin. That week, ABC News with Diane Sawyer did a two-hour special on a Friday night. And I remember watching her standing in front of a smart board. I'll never forget this. And the anger that I felt as I changed the channel because I couldn't listen to any more of it. I promise you, she was saying this, that throughout the course of human history, we've had it wrong with respect to understanding of gender. And so for the last 6,000 years, we just understood it this way. And so now, all of a sudden, I mean, so every, I mean, to think of the hubris, think of the arrogance it takes to say, because it's one thing for me to say, Shelby, you're wrong. Well, let me give you an example. All right, so my, our family just played in church on Sunday. I know you're, you're still reveling in the glow of that. But um, anyway, uh, those of you that, that know our kids, I mean, it's amazing the differences in, in, in personality and the fact that they came from the same recipe is still kind of staggering. But uh, Andrew is uh, one of our kids. That, well, any kid can be stubborn, but sometimes Andrew can just, he gets something settled in his mind, and that's just how it is. And th there are times where, and like playing mandolin, that, and, and bluegrass, you, you're kind of the percussion. So that you've got the chop, so boom, chop, boom, chop, boom, chop. And, you're, and so if the mandolin is off, that really matters. That really matters. And so if we can get to a point where it, we, we just stop because we've got a train wreck. We say, Andrew, you're off. No, I'm not. You are off. <laughs> Everybody? Not, not just, but all of us? Yes. <laughs> like, I mean, it's tough to argue with that. It's one thing to say that somebody's wrong. It's, one, it's another thing to say that everybody's wrong. And I could not believe that I was watching Diane Sawyer say, everybody, the entire course of human history has been wrong. I feel like I should put an offering on the altar of her brilliance. I mean, for her to realize everybody has had it, the unmitigated pride and arrogance, the haughtiness it takes to say something as foolish as that, as arrogant and as pompous as that, is beyond the pale. But that's exactly what we are being told. And again, you are seeing this, and, and, and especially from, uh, from modern academia. I'm not saying, I'm a painting with a broad brush stroke, and certainly there are exemptions to this, even uh, among some of the most left-leaning institutions uh, in the country and around the United States. But you're seeing this coming from academia, and it's working its way down into the local school system, and it's in curriculum, and it's in textbooks. And this is what you are, are, are being taught. Now, one of the things that we need to realize this is that since... The opening chapters of Genesis, what we have is Satan operating this way. He wants us. He wanted Adam and Eve. He wants me. He wants you to experience desired goals through illegitimate means. To experience desired goals through illegitimate means. All right, so what was the first desired goal that Satan, through illegitimate means that we know about, tried to accomplish? Be like God. In the sense, all right, so be like God. All right, so when, when Lucifer comes to Eve and describes this whole idea of being, by, being like God, they say, you know, I believe that through more shared time with, 
more conversations with, more paying attention to how He operates. In time, you can increasingly pattern yourself so that you are operating like God and begin to see things as He sees them. Did He say that? No, He offers a shortcut through an illegitimate means, through an a, um, out-of-bounds means. Here, this, this fruit that has been put in the do not touch category, or excuse me, the do not eat category, you experience that. So he was offering the desired goal, but through illegitimate means. I mean, part of the way in which God has made us is that He's made us as sexual beings, and so that He has wired us, and there's these, these chemicals running through our, our bodies that are, are prompting desires and urges and feelings that long to be satisfied, but Satan is using this structure to lead us to fulfill those desires through illegitimate means. And part of the way that you can get there is by taking God out of the equation. And so you wind up here in deviant sexuality, and I'm not just talking about, from my perspective, uh, homosexuality, but even deviant sexuality with respect to gender. This is not the norm, I mean, at least the biblical norm. You get there when he's not part He's, when he's not step one. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm going to tie this up here in just a second. But in, any, any bones you want to pick or questions you've got at this point? Well, hopefully you'll be getting to it. Um, first of all, in this series, will you be talking about homosexuality anymore? Or is this a well, uh, this tonight pretty well covers it. Okay. If you need so me to... we've got 40,000 students in Garfield County. Okay. Over 200,000 in Gifford County people. How are we going to, how is society, you know, how is anything going to change? You know, I mean, uh, one person made a time like that. I mean, uh, a couple of things. One, I think one of the things that we have to admit is that the Bible seems pretty clear, even though there's a lot of details that we don't know. Um, generally speaking, it's going to get a lot worse. Now, that doesn't mean that we just throw up the white flag and say, well, I'm going to bury my head in the sand and I'm just going to put my blinders on. And we do not seek to have in, uh, conversations, engage our culture, and to take stands and to communicate biblical truth. But I think it, we do have to remind ourselves that the Bible is very clear that as we work closer to whenever it is that Jesus comes back, uh, that it will have gotten particularly worse. Uh, now, also throughout the course of human history, there have been some pretty bad times. There have, and some some instances where I'm sure there were multiplied generations that well, I mean, look at look at Elijah. You remember after having defeated the prophets of Baal, you think he's like beating his chest with enthusiasm. But what does he do? Do you remember? He goes and hides, and he, and he says, God, go ahead and kill me. Why? He says, I alone am left. And so I mean, he, he's like, I, I am it. Um, and hopefully you don't think, and we don't think in this room, well, we are it. We're not. Thankfully, there are others. But I think we do have to admit, yes, it is going to get worse. But I think it... Uh, it should reinforce to us just how consequential the stakes are. And I mean, something that Caroline said, uh, what, last week or the week before, I mean, we are a failure in any generation and what happens to the message. And so if, if our faith is not passed on and if we aren't sharing this, I mean, it takes one generation before it disappears. I mean, it's just simply gone. Um, yeah, any other questions, brilliant comments? I have lots of questions about raising children in this context, but I'm hoping that's very good. Well, that's, that, that, so, that was lengthy <laughs> foundational stuff to talk about some brass tack stuff. So, the question is, how do you combat this? I mean, what do you do as a parent, as a grandparent? as, I mean, if you don't have kids, I mean, wh whatever stage that you're in, I think, first of all, we have to realize that every single one of us is capable of influence. We are. 
Now, uh, let me go, in fact, before I go into that, let me go back to something that, um, that Paul alluded to earlier back in the Genesis thing. That Genesis 1, 27 and 26, or 26, 27 tells us that we are made, that we are made in God's image, that we are made male and female. And why is that? Do you remember what you said, Paul? B because there was a plan and purpose for reproduction. God was planning to do something, and He wanted from Adam and Eve there to come, what? A, f a family. And I hope you understand that the family has, since the very beginning, that's been the building block that God works with. You're going to build a world full of people? You start with a family. In fact, even with the church itself, consistently in how the church is structured and operates. Do you realize, and have you paid attention to the language that Paul uses to describe how it operates? It always harkens back to the family. Just as the husband is head of the wife, so Christ is head of the church. I mean, it, it's always going back to family, and it goes back to, to the fact that we are made. We are made with purpose, plan, and intentionality because God was up to something, and He's still up to something. And so how do we combat this? Um, the first thing, we, we have to understand, you got to get make sure that you're in the game. And, and, and it is, and I mean by, by more than in the game, that you, you have to be paying attention to what's going on. And it may be some of the words that uh, we have used tonight, you're like, I hadn't heard that one. Well, if you haven't heard non-binary, if you haven't uh, heard some of these, then, then you, you need to start paying more attention to what's going on because these, these, this language is... Um, rapidly, rapidly becoming the norm. And you're hearing this all the time. So you need to be engaged and know what's going on. And you, you, you can't lead where you have not been, and you cannot share what you do not possess. So you've got, to, you've got to get settled in your mind, in your own heart. Hey, if I'm going to pass this on, is this really what I believe? Is this what the Bible says? Is this, what really, is this how it really operates? I need to get that settled in my mind. And then I need to celebrate this very simple fact. I have a purposeful existence. It ought to be good news that I've erased it. It ought to be really good news that what we are told is not correct. That I'm not the ooze. That I don't have a purposeless existence. I hope it comes as really good news. And as you look at your, your, look at your children, your grandchildren's eyes, you're looking at the person that has purpose, that has meaning. They're not a fluke. They're not an accident. I, I remember having a conversation with Carolyn Tart years ago when her, her sister died. There was 10 years between she and her sister. And her sister died. I, I, think, I, might, I, I think I did that funeral. And I said, when I was preparing for it, oh, that's crazy. I said, no, 10 years, that's almost like two different families, but you know, same mom and dad. And she said, yeah, mama told me one of them was an accident and the other was a mistake. I forget, but like, um, anyway, it's, it's one thing to say that in jest, but it's another thing to be told, you really have no purpose. So you need to celebrate the fact that that's not true. That's not the case. You as an individual have purpose in your existence. Your family, your children has purpose and intentionality in its existence. Um, and this is... a word that matters. Um, Is that a positive or negative word? Oh, I mean, in the scheme of things, it's kind of neutral, isn't it? Because it depends on what you're doing. It's on what you're doing. Regularly, how do we hear this word? Negative. We hear it negatively. Like, uh, uh, whatever. So we're, that we're in, uh, give me the sentence. Or use it in a negative way. Without your bad words. <laughs> Don't need your D indoctrination. <laughs> All right, so higher education is indoctrinating our children to believe liberal ideologies. All right, so 
the thought behind that is they are see behind that statement is there is this series of ideas and beliefs that they are seeking to impute, not to impute, but to transfer into the minds and the hearts of their students. Now, in, in, in that sentence, that is the, the, uh, the weight, is, I mean, if somebody's saying that, typically they're weighting that negatively. Um, candidly, though, is it not the case if you are in, I mean, just generally speaking, whether it is a, it's, it's an academic institution, whether it is God-less or God-focused, does it not have that as its goal? I mean, aren't you paying tuition so that you can go sit in a class so that somebody can dump some data into you? I, I have heard people say, well, listen, I don't want to indoctrinate my kids. Well, if, if, if you don't, you're an idiot. You are an absolute fool if you don't want to indoctrinate your kids because the culture does. Teachers do. Their friends do. Oh, the American. <laughs> but I'm telling you, everybody is looking to indoctrinate. So if, if you are somebody that has as your starting point, listen, I'm not, I'm not a fluke. I am made. My kids are made. I, I, want to, I want to indoctrinate them with that reality. And so d don't look at this as a negative. Look, this, is, this, is, this is what's going on. My kids, when they're going to school, they're being, they're being indoctrinated. Among, and some of it is, I mean, they're being indoctrinated with vocabulary words. Some are in textbooks and some are on bathroom walls, but they're being indoctrinated with vocabulary. Um, they're being indoctrinated with numbers and math equations, but they're also being indoctrinated with worldview. Worldview that can come from textbooks, worldview that can come from classmates, that can come from teachers, that can come from a whole lot of places. When you watch the news, you're being indoctrinated. When you read, I mean, we are constantly experiencing this. Your kids are experiencing this. And what I'm saying is that your family better experience some of this from you because they're experiencing it from everybody else. All right, so um, next thing I said is this. Hmm, I can write. I mean, the weight is on those clear boundaries. I think a lot of times families get into trouble, and, and Kristen, with respect to I mean, thinking about how this operates with, um, and specifically these issues of human sexuality and gender. And next week, we're going to be dealing with, with gender roles and about being a man and about being a woman. But we need to operate with very clear boundaries about the fact that one of the boundaries is there's what we're going to indoctrinate our children, our grandchildren, those that are subject to our influence with is the notion, the boundaries are there's man and woman, period. That's how it is. Anything else is arbitrary. It's made up. It's not, that's not how it actually is. And in, in the home, I think it needs to be such that that is erected early on as a clear boundary to say, listen, we're not going to engage in even the possibility that that's the case, that, that, it's, that it's something other than that. I, I think kids need to know, not just with this issue, but with a whole stack of issues, um, there's an electric fence up and the power's on. That, that this is a boundary and we're not going to cross that. Um, let me give you an example. Um, Nathan is our oldest, and I don't remember how old he was. We were still in Charlotte, so he was, I don't know, let's say three-ish. And my sister had been to the dollar store, and she bought, I don't know why she thought this was funny, but she bought this, what was it? It was like, it was this thing that would go in your hair, but it was like long... It's like a crown with princess hair coming down from it. Like a you know, kind of tiara hairband, something like that, and got it for Nathan. <laughs> oh, that's so, that's so funny. Put that in your hair. Uh-uh. Let's go in the garbage. Oh, why? Why? It's just, it's just fun. Uh-uh. 
because th there are boundaries. And the boundary is there are men and there are women. And men are going to act like men. Boys are going to act like boys. Girls are going to act like girls. And women are going to act like women. And so from the earliest of ages and stages, the thought has been we need to operate with some very clearly defined boundaries. And as, as we have had conversations about human sexuality and about uh, reproduction, about all those things, and anytime we talk about these issues, though, and we're talking about them with our kids. In fact, sometimes uh, earlier than you would necessarily even have to think. I mean, uh, we used to have Netflix until, what was the name of that show, Babysitter's Club? Catherine was watching the Babysitter's Club, and some of, some of you had read, I know uh, you were a big Babysitter's Club, weren't you, um, Lance? I know, I know, he's got, he's got the whole... <laughs> 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 but babysitter's Club, well, that's, that, that's a girl's book series. When's, when is that popular? What, fifth, sixth grade, maybe? Yeah, but anyway, so there's a, uh, the sitcom on there. Not sitcom, but there's a, a series on Netflix based on this. And... Catherine is watching this, and Caroline happens to be in the room, and I mean, you would think this is a pretty innocuous thing, though, but what's going on in, in that show? I mean, you've got this boy that comes out in a dress, and what did he say? Well, that, like, it, the, there's a babysitter there, and the child said, well, that's my old closet, this is my new closet, and it has girls clothes, and it's clearly a boy. And then you see the babysitter talking to the other babysitter about it, and she said, well, you're left-handed and you've had to learn how to use left-hand scissors and you know he's just kind of like left-handed like and just kind of, and kept going but this was this show is designed for like prepubescent girls and I was shocked I read the baby series babysitter's club series like there was divorce in it but there was none of this no transgender children so we canceled Netflix because it was like I can't relax and if I can't relax like I can't I can't have my child just flipping through something so we got rid of it. Now there's some stuff that's on Netflix that's probably good. It probably is, but it kind of felt like we were setting up camp next to Sodom and Gomorrah. Like it was just like too much for me, too much. But, but, but as part of that, then it becomes a teaching moment to say, listen, th this, is, this is why we're getting rid of this, and um, this is why this is objectionable. And it goes back to indoctrination in a positive sense. The, you, you, this is doctrine. These are ideas, beliefs, and worldviews that need to be passed on. You intentionally share those things. You have clearly defined boundaries. Uh, and if you are doing that and you guard those boundaries, you have to guard influences. Um, we talked last week about some, uh, with respect to technology, a whole lot of threats to guard against. But uh, and I think I'm going to have to press the, the pause button, or at least the stop button here in a second. But um, you can't do this stuff if you're not guarding influences. If your kids, if your grandkids can be friends and hang out and they get to have limitless uh, social media time and limitless in-person time with anybody and everybody, you don't have any control over the influences over your, in your child's life. If that's the case, you're not guarding their heart, you're not guarding their mind, and you're not combating this at all. You are allowing others to have their way with your child's mind and heart. If you want to do that, I mean, that's on your watch. I don't want it to be for me. Anyway, um, I'm out of time, so I, won't, I will stop because we have children's workers that would like you to get your children. And so, um, but we can think some more and hopefully give some more specific examples to help think through some of this. Any other brief thing? Pray with me then. Lord, the stuff we've been talking about tonight really matters. And we don't have to watch much TV or read many news articles or magazines before the issues that we're talking about become front and center. And I pray that we leave with a reinforced understanding that as a person, I am made, and I am made wonderfully, I am made in your image, and you made me with plan, with purpose, and intentionality. And I pray that that comes as really good news to me and to everybody in this room. Nobody here is a fluke. Nobody here has, is void of purpose. But I pray, God, that you help us to communicate that to our children, to our grandchildren, to any that are within the scope of our influence, that that's how it is, that they are made. And if they are made and they have purpose, intentionality, that means that they don't just decide what's best. 
that there are parameters and there are boundaries that the one who has made us, purposes that you have created us for, and that we need to pay attention to that. Long after we leave, Lord, if there are questions that we have, I pray that you lead us to, to reach out to get resolution to those. If there's uh, things that you need to show us that we need to make adjustments on in our own homes, I pray that we'll pay attention to, to what you're saying. If there are threats that we have thus far been um, blind to, help us to see them. And so I just pray, God, that you might use the things that we've talked about tonight in our time together to make a difference in the lives of our families. That's what we pray, and we do so in Christ's name. Amen. Have a good night.